Hello, and welcome to Asia In Depth. I'm Michelle Fleur Cruz. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced governments around the world to manage a huge public health risk using lockdowns, travel bans, digital contact tracing, and other tools. Some countries have been shining examples of how the outbreak was successfully managed. Others are the target of widespread criticism. This has sparked a public discussion about whether certain kinds of governments have been more effective. Can one make the case that democratic or authoritarian governments are better equipped to deal with COVID-19? That was the subject of this week's episode of Asia In Depth with Fareed Zakaria, author and host of the CNN show Fareed Zakaria GPS and Asia Society Policy Institute president and former prime minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. But their conversation also came just one week after the murder of George Floyd and the worldwide protests that have followed. That's where Fareed Zakaria begins the conversation. It is certainly the most serious set of racial protests or racially motivated protests uh, since 1968. Uh, And if you remember, 68, 69 is the period of the the, the assassinations of Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, campus-wide protests about uh, uh, Vietnam, civil rights, civil unrest. Um, and I think that it's happening because of, I don't know, I mean, if I, I would say there's sort of four backdrops to keep in mind. The first is, this is America's original sin. And for foreigners, I think it's important to remind people that this is the, you know, the, uh, the curse of the heart of the American founding, uh, which was, uh, the treatment of blacks. They were, they were you know, never treated uh, as, as human beings. Sometimes I've had friends of mine who are immigrants say, well, you know, how come uh, other immigrants seem to do all right? And it's important to remember, this is the only group of, uh, of immigrants to the United States who came in chains, involuntarily, in servitude, and were made slaves, were made property for 250 years. And then for a hundred years were treated essentially like serfs in a Jim Crow uh, system that denied them rights. And it's only been 50 years since that legacy has, uh, has formally been changed. And so there is a deep, deep set of inequities built into the system that have never really been fully addressed. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, it's, you can still go to the South and you will find states that celebrate the birthday of Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, Um, you will still find boulevards named after him. You know, it would be like going to Germany and finding a Himmler Boulevard or something like that. So that piece of it has never really been healed. Uh, And the United States has never fully kind of grappled with it. There's been no Truth and Reconciliation Commission as in South Africa. There hasn't been a process as in Rwanda or in Germany. The second piece of this, I think, is American policing has become extremely uh, aggressive. Uh, If you, I'm sure you noticed this, Kevin, when you came to to, to, uh, New York um, and spent enough time that you that you notice it, which is American cops look like an army uh, compared to any other police force in the world. They look like an invading army. They use the same weaponry. They have doctrines that are very similar. They approach the situation with that kind of almost counterinsurgency. Uh, attitude. Uh, and then you layer onto it the racial component, you see what's, what's going on. The third point I'd make, and this relates to our general conversation, there are 45 million people in the United States who are unemployed and have been unemployed for three months. Um, this is a, you know, a, now there is a lot of unemployment insurance and there are safety cushions and such, but, you know, it's a, it, it's a very anxiety provoking, uneasy, stressful time where people feel lost and purposeless. uh, And that sense of anxiety must be contributing in some measure to some of this. And the final point I would make, and this is something you you mentioned in a very sharp uh, tweet of yours uh, recently, uh, we've had an appalling lack of leadership uh, at the federal level from from the president. Uh, This is the kind of issue uniquely suited to presidential leadership, to moral leadership, because ultimately it's not going to get solved tomorrow. As I said, I mean, this has been a problem for the United States since its founding. Uh, And and there's no magic wand anyone can can wave. But you could demonstrate that you have empathy. 
that you that, that you you know you, your heart is in the right place that you are trying to set things in motion a lot of what needs to happen is actually at the local level when you look at criminal justice reform but to have a president who could articulate that and so i think all those things came together and the sense of you know with this president uh, the sense of particular hopelessness that people must have uh, felt so I think it's a very, it's a very important uh, moment in, in the United States. And fascinating to me, it is, there is a kind of resonance around the world. I mean, there are people protesting in about 20 countries in sympathy for this, this movement in the United States, which tells you, you know, at some level, America still retains some, it has a space in, in the imagination of people around the world. Hmm. It's been extraordinary at the extent to which this has been uh, catalyzed within the United States, this appalling murder uh, of um, Mr. Floyd in um, Minnesota. Uh, and then it uh, then um, uh, brings together uh, the sea and um, seething uh, sentiments which you've just described in your four points. Uh, it becomes this um, explosive moment. Uh, mass unemployment, 250 years of uh, enslavement, um, and a deep, um, a deeply polarizing president, um, uh, all in all in one. Speaking of the president, uh, Fareed, uh, what do you make of what his actual strategy is? Uh, in doing, for example, what he did in the last 24 hours in Washington and walked out in front of St. John's Episcopal Church, church wherever I'm in D.C., it's the church I go to, just behind the White House. You know it well as well. Um, and then uh, held the Bible in his hand and, uh, and issued his proclamation, uh, whatever it was, that proclamation. So what I'm interested in is what do you think is the operational strategy uh, within the White House against the background of COVID-19, where, as an external observer, it strikes me that the president has been, as it were, losing the political fight um, in terms of the upcoming presidential elections, has uh, been unable to manage the crisis effectively domestically. So for the benefit of our audience, could you contextualise this for us in terms of what he's seeking to do and the effectiveness of what he's doing as well, politically speaking. So I think that if you look at what Trump's political strategy was in January, it was pretty clear. He was going to, he was going to run on peace and prosperity, the stock market, everything was doing well. Um, he was taking credit for it all. Uh, and in fact, you know, to remind people that that was a time in where he was not just being nice to China, he was lavishly praising Xi Jinping, constantly talking about what a great man he was, how he loves his country, how they were trying so hard to deal with this COVID problem that's out there. Uh, and, but, you know, we're working very hard with them. So that, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that somebody counted there 27 different times that in, in just January and February that President Trump praised uh, the Chinese uh, government and Xi personally. Then things start to go south in exactly the way you described. COVID hits, he handles it badly. Uh, the num case numbers explode. People start criticizing him for how he's handling it. And perhaps most significantly, uh, Biden's poll numbers uh, go up and his go down. Uh, and I think he begins to get very worried. Now, remember, he's always been worried about Joe Biden. This is why the whole Ukraine shenanigan took place. He's always thought that Joe Biden was the principal um, the most, the strongest Democrat against him. So in those circumstances, Trump seems to always go to his core strategy, which is populist nationalism. And I put an emphasis on the nationalism. So if you look at 2016, uh, essentially that campaign was about um, the Mexicans, to a certain extent, China, People now forget, but a lot of it was about Muslims, Muslim terrorists, Islam. Uh, and, and that was really Trump's genius in a way was to recognize that the country or certainly a part of the country was, was um, much more interested in those conversations uh, 
than about the usual Republican, Republican conversations about limited government and tax cuts and balanced budgets and things. You know, he broke from the Reagan formula and he said, I'm going to talk to you about, you know, the Mexicans are taking your jobs, the Chinese are taking your, your, you know, your factories and the Muslims are trying to kill you. And that's, that was, I mean, in one line, that was his, his, his message. He has now clearly decided that what he is going to do this, the 2020 campaign on is China. China brought us COVID. They're a terrible, you know, nasty country. Um, he's doubled down very strongly on immigration. This hasn't been noticed as much because there's so much going on. But the Trump administration taking advantage of COVID has almost tried to shut down immigration into the United States in various different ways. It's used a number of small measures, a couple of big measures, but they are trying to radically slow down immigration and force the Democrats, by the way, to defend uh, immigrants. You know, so, so what he's trying to do is force the Democrats to defend China, defend immigrants, and then this comes along. And this plays right into that strategy, uh, which he had mumbled that he had done a little bit of. It's the sort of the whole law and order uh, uh, approach. I, you know, it'd be interesting just to, to, to figure out um, what exactly the polling is telling him. I don't get the sense that it's working. I get the sense that it's actually, uh, it's adding to the sense that he is not in control, that he is not handling his responsibilities well. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, one would have to hope that this kind of thing doesn't get vindicated. I, I, I don't pretend to know, but, you know, just a looking at that image of, the, of, the, of, of Trump holding the Bible, I'm not a Christian, but I grew up in India and went to Christian school my whole life. And, you know, the, the dominant message of, Chris, of Christianity, as far as I can tell, uh, particularly the New Testament, is blessed are the poor, blessed are the oppressed, blessed are the weak. Um, that is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And for him to be taking that document and you know, really abusing the, the essential meaning of it by doing, essential, by doing the opposite while laying some kind of symbolic claim to it uh, is kind of appalling. And I hope, I hope he gets called out for it. It's, the political strategy is, um, is um, of the type, I think, that you've described and elegantly in terms of the Mexican play, the broader immigrant play, the um, China play, leaving aside the intrinsic merits or demerits of, uh, of uh, China's strategy and how it behaves at home and abroad. And now it seems um, in terms of African-Americans um, um, and therefore the meta message with all three is A, it's us versus them and B, uh, we intend to use wedge politics to force the Democrats to defend them, um, the non-us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and as you yeah. said, the, alchem the political alchemy of this uh, has been deployed by forces of political right for some time in various democracies. But I think what causes most people's jaws to drop is the, uh, is the exactitude with which it's deployed by this particular president. Um, uh, I don't think we'd describe him as a student of political science, uh, but uh, he certainly, as a visceral right-wing politician, understands powerfully the politics of nation and race as uh, dispensing with the rest of what you and I would describe as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> it, uh, it suffuses the lot. This brings us, um, Fareed, to what we actually agreed to come and discuss this morning, which was the effectiveness of democracies like America, um, self-proclaimed in the United States as the world's oldest democracy, uh, uh, not that claim usually not accepted by most other democracies, but uh, we, we entertain our American friends with this prospect uh, and possibility. But how democracies have handled COVID-19 versus authoritarian states and the gray zone, which uh, frankly exists between those two neat categorizations of political science. Um, um, so perhaps I could uh, throw a general question to you is both in the um, identification of the problem, <clears throat> that is the emergence of COVID-19. Um, secondly, the um, 
uh, measures taken to contain the virus, and then thirdly, where it now travels in terms of economic recovery. Give us your sense from a global perspective of the scorecard between uh, democratic systems and authoritarian systems, large and small. Uh, who's being most effective? Who's being least effective? Or is there no clear data emerging from what we are seeing around the world? Your thoughts on that, Farid? Sure, it's a fascinating question. And um, I think that we, we, don't, you know, we don't have real clarity yet because we're in the middle of the movie uh, and we're mm. watching and studying. But I, I, I think here's what we can say. First, let's remember this hit the democracies hardest and first. And the reason is, it hit the most globalized part of the world first because it is, you know, it is caused by travel. It is spread by travel. And of course, the most connected places in the world are the richest places in the world. And most of the richest countries in the world are democracies. And so because of that, the democracies have borne the brunt of this much more than, uh, than most authoritarian regimes. If you think about, you know, the vast numbers of authoritarian, authoritarian regimes in, in, in Central Asia or the ones in Africa, uh, still relatively sheltered. Um, if you look at, you know, a hierarchy of who handled it well overall, I think you'd have to say that basically the democracies come out better. There are more sterling examples of democracies that have done well than authoritarian regimes. Probably the single best country is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan with, with uh, you know, large population, very densely packed cities. Uh, Taipei is, you know, incredibly densely packed. Has, I think, 10 deaths, or maybe it may be eight. The last time I saw it was eight. I think I, I noticed it had gone up a little bit. Eight deaths. Um, mm. Hong Kong, by the way, has had four deaths. Very, very small number. South Korea is famously has handled it very well and has handled the complexities of small outbreaks uh, very well. Singapore has handled it pretty well with the one exception of in its migrant worker population. Um, so there you see a mixture. Uh, I don't know how you'd characterize Hong Kong, but I would point out even the places that have done well, the authoritarian uh, regimes or the non-democracies like Singapore and Hong Kong have not used particularly authoritarian methods. They've just been good. They've been good government. There's been, you know, the contact tracing has been good detective work. They did not appropriate vast amounts of data from people's phones and things like that. The best uh, places in, in the West, probably Germany, uh, Denmark, um, uh, uh, Iceland, um, again, very democratic. Uh, Iceland, by the way, has managed to do extraordinarily well without even using masks. Now, that's partly because it's a big and sparsely populated country. Uh, Australia, your own uh, uh, country, has done particularly uh, pretty well. Again, remember, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Australia get huge numbers of visitors from China. So the fact that they were able to do so well, New Zealand given that... As well. mm. Pardon? New Zealand as well. Mm. New Zealand as well, exactly. Given that, uh, is, 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 is particularly interesting. Um, so I think that there's really no grounds on which to say that the authoritarian regimes did well. There is the, the China case, which is the mm. big one, which I'm sure you know, we will get to. But if you take China out of it, um, there's very little indication it's been handled very well. Now, of course, democracies have also done badly. Brazil probably is handling it uh, you know, the worst among certainly large countries. Um, but I'd say in general, uh, you know, the, the, the democracies have done pretty well, and here's why. There are two things that seem to matter. Having good, competent local government, and many democracies, particularly rich democracies, do have that, and trust. The ability to actually have, you know, consistent, clear communication between the government and its people, where the people view these as legitimate, understand the concern. That, that process, which is so clearly works so well in the German case, you know, you can see it from Merkel mm -hmm. downwards where they communicated in a completely consistent, uh, fact-based ma uh, ma uh, ma uh, ma manner. That is, I wouldn't say it's intrinsic to democracy, but certainly there is a great deal about democracy that bolsters that. Um, authoritarian regimes can force you to do things for sure, but that, that can produce a lot of its own foibles and tensions. And as I say, that, you know, that brings up the case of China. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think um, what I deduce from your response is, uh, is that the data is at least mixed or trending in the direction of supporting, in fact, the um, effective systems deployed by trusted democracies. Um, yeah, for me, the poster child in so much of this has been uh, the Taiwanese, which given proximity, given density of population, and I've lived in Taiwan as a kid learning Chinese, so I kind of remember what it's like and I've been back many times. These are big cities too. Uh, Taipei is not a small yeah. town. And, uh, and sure, it's not the People's Republic of China and it's not Japan, but it's 22 million people, which is twice the size of Belgium. Um, and it's bigger than the Netherlands, um, and it's bigger than all of Scandinavia put together as a population on a tiny piece of real estate. They've kind of done reasonably well. So what does it go down to? It goes down to trust and capacity. I think these are the two subsets of what you've described. Do I trust um, those guys and girls on television who, who are saying that they are ministers responsible for public health and public safety? Um, and are they being transparent with me? And secondly, if they're being transparent with me, uh, do their uh, government instrumentalities have the capacity to then protect me? Yeah. Um, and so far, looking at, you know, the New Zealand response in Australia, the state government response in Australia, the state governments are responsible for public health. Um, they're responsible for public education, whether schools are opened or closed as well as um, obviously policing. And they've all been seen in this country to have performed particularly well. So then we're left with the puzzling democracies like America and the puzzling democracies like the United Kingdom. What went down there? <laughs> uh, um, I think that's a, it's a fascinating, you put, you put it so well. Um, I think there are two things going on in the, in the United States and the United Kingdom. The first is there has been a 40-year assault on government uh, from you know, Reagan, Thatcher onward. And as you know, while it has swept in some ways across the world, you know, places like Australia um, didn't, didn't quite uh, implement the kind of uh, draconian cuts that took place over a 40-year period. If you think about it as the starving of investment in government, the starving of capacity, and the, and, the, and the ethos that said, as Reagan famously said, government is not the solution, government is the problem. You know, and it's all the way to Steve Bannon comes into the White House and he says, our goal is to deconstruct the administrative state. Well, it turns out the administrative state is what you need. That's the capacity you're describing. And I think there, was a, there, there has been a lot of that in both uh, Britain and the United States. But I think the other piece going to your trust point is... Trump immediately took this uh, and, and turned it into a political issue. Um, and it inevitably divided, right? Because then you have governors saying one thing, you have the president saying something, medical experts saying something else. Um, you had a little bit of that in Britain as well, more so in America. But when that happens, you know, the public is, doesn't feel like they're all on the same team. Everybody is under, you know, under that, that you, you shatter that notion of trust. And so I think those two things account for the very bad starts. Now, to be fair, um, you know, the US, uh, the US per capita is doing about middling. It's not terrible. It, you know, we, the US always gets, it, it, it is, the spotlight is always on the United States of America. And so it always looks, uh, we wash our dirty linen very publicly. But, you know, the US is sort of in the middle of the industrialized world. There are countries that have done better than it. Um, it's not certainly at the, the top end we were talking about of the South Koreans, Taiwanese and things like that. The Germans uh, would be up, in, up there. But there are a lot of countries in Europe that have done worse than the United States. Uh, but given the resources, given the capacity, I mean, the U.S. is home to the CDC and the NIH and all these, these, these uh, public health agencies that the world over trust, given all that, the fact that it failed, it did so badly is astonishing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I do think that leadership matters. The, Johns Hopkins did a, uh, a ranking of countries that were on their, literally on their preparedness for global pandemics uh, and released it two months ago. I remember because we did a segment on this in the show. The U.S. was ranked number one because on paper with the CDC, the NIH, with the incredible research labs, with the, you know, but as you know, Kevin, the American system is very disorganized and decentralized unless the White House has 
really in charge, controlling things, directing things, forcing these various agencies to cooperate, forcing local and state governments to cooperate. You can have all this capacity out there, but it, 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 what you end up with is chaos rather than those energies all being deployed in the right direction. It's important, I think, as you say, Farid, to see this in a historical sweep in terms of what's happened across the West. Um, the Reagan-Thatcher uh, revolution, uh, uh, kill the beast, kill Leviathan, uh, kill the, uh, the state. Um, in the British context, the Atlean state, the Rooseveltian state in the United States, and its equivalents in other parts of uh, the Western world. And that um, rightly or wrongly, in my judgment, wrongly, because I'm a social democrat, uh, this uh, rolls on through the 80s and the 90s and into the noughties. And the underlying ethos is um, uh, state capacity bad and inefficient, therefore defund it, uh, privatise it to the greatest extent you can. And if you won't privatise it voluntarily, we'll kill the tax supply so you have no alternative. And these things exactly. simply shrivel on the vine. So the script has been fairly universal. Um, and I remember coming to office myself uh, a decade or so ago in Australia saying, uh, actually, uh, government does good things. Uh, government uh, provides capacity. And in the absence of uh, government, uh, let me t ask this question, what's the systemic alternative? Um, and in America, you, you, people constantly, uh, rightly proclaim the virtues of this spontaneous philanthropic society which has its origins in the 19th and 18th centuries and it's generous and it's uh, and it's innovative and does wonderful things in pockets of america <laughs> but large swaths of the country just remain untouched and so you bring this down to public health in america and as someone who's lived in new york for the last five years um i trot off to mount sinai i trot off to the the hospital for special surgery uh, i receive first class global treatment and 95% uh, of Americans don't. <laughs> and then you get to the bottom 50% in the income uh, percentile and it's, uh, it becomes progressively thin. And so it is across the system. So this shakiness of the public health system as a response, but shakiness also of people's trust in a system to deal with the country equitably at a time of uh, crisis. But let's not let our authoritarian friends off the hook here. I mean, I've been looking carefully at what happened in China. And um, the first three weeks of the outbreak uh, is a big story in itself, um, uh, leaving aside all the conspiracy theories uh, which have been perpetrated about uh, China deliberately or accidentally allowing this virus to erupt from uh, secret laboratories hanging about in the suburbs of, uh, of Wuhan with people dressed in, um, in uh, bat gear in the bat cave. Um, there has been uh, a um, major problem. China did not learn effectively from SARS. The wet markets, it seems, were not closed down, despite the virtues of this authoritarian system. So they have laws to shut down wet markets post-SARS, but they're not shut down. Then we have the outbreak and this very ugly period in December, January, between the uh, Wuhan and uh, Hubei municipal and provincial authorities and the centre in terms of what's going on here, how much was concealed from the centre, how much did the centre conceal, and what then happens between the centre in Beijing and the World Health Organization. And the uh, eruption of discontent in the Chinese um, social media space in those critical months of January, February about, um, uh, am I being lied to? And still questions about, am I being lied to about the real numbers in China? So you have that with an authoritarian system, yet next door in Vietnam, uh, a country which barely receives any attention despite the fact it's a big population in a small country with large cities, where as of now, there are virtually no reported deaths uh, from COVID-19. Um, and despite their own um, hardline lockdown and closing of borders, um, it seems to have recovered reasonably well. So within the authoritarian world, can I have some reflections from you, Farid, about how they've actually, how they've actually gone? Uh, well, you, 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 you set the, the scene, I think, exactly right and described the Chinese situation exactly right. 
I think the only thing I, you know, the things I would add are, it, it would probably have been tough for anyone because the, uh, the virus burst on the, the stage and people often forget, you know, initially you don't know that you have a respiratory a virus that is spreading very fast. You just know that there are people getting ill and you don't quite understand why. But it's fair to say that the nature of a authoritarian system like China's depends upon the control of information and the silencing of dissent and the silencing of doubt. Uh, and that clearly played very uh, badly for the Chinese. As you said, there's no question the local governments, uh, Wuhan and Hubei, covered stuff up. And they were covering it up because they didn't want to spook the markets, they didn't want to spook growth, they didn't want to interfere with, you. as you know, there were important Chinese Communist Party meetings and gatherings taking place. This is the time of Chinese New Year. So for all those reasons, they were trying to hush it up. Um, we then have some indication that, in, that the center was complicit. It's not entirely clear. Uh, what we do know is that they sat on the information for about a week. That's absolutely clear. That they declared an internal emergency within China, but they did not inform the world. Now, you can say a week isn't that long, but remember when you're dealing with exponential growth, that, that, that does play a big uh, part. It, it, you know, the, the, we would sp probably still have a pandemic. I think people who say that the, this could have been stopped, as Trump keeps saying, uh, is highly unlikely, given how globalized the world is. If the Chinese had told us on the 14th of, or the 7th of January rather than the 14th, uh, I don't know that it would have made that much difference. Um, mm. But it's, it, it clearly is the kind of systemic flaw of China that we have, that was exposed, which is that this control and suppression of information is at the heart of the system. I don't think it's as cancerous as it was in the Soviet case with Chernobyl, but it, it is of the same nature though of a, you know, of a different degree for a variety of reasons. The Chinese Communist Party is quite competent and responsive in, in ways that the Soviet Communist Party never was. But I think there's another part which often isn't talked about. Once they figured it out and started to act, they may have also massively overreacted, used enormous excessive force, done things that, were com that would turn out to be completely unnecessary. The lockdown of Hubei and Wuhan, the lockdown then of 750 million people for a long time. They, and then they did use very extreme harsh measure, measures, the quarantining of people by separating them from their families. I mean, you know, at some level, did you say it worked? Yes, the Chinese numbers are down. But look, it's worked in Taiwan, as you point out. It's worked in South Korea. It's worked in Hong Kong. It's worked in, in Singapore. It worked in Australia. None of which had to do that. And I think it actually set a very bad model for the world of what you had to do to try to shut this down. I frankly think that we have had an excessive lockdown in part because people uh, overly, uh, they learned too much from the Chinese experience and we should have kept in mind, look, this is a authoritarian government whose response to anything is going to be, you know, kind of extreme in that measure. I think you could have had probably a more modulated lockdown. You, you could have, for example, quarantined older people who are much more clearly at, at risk. You could have allowed parts of the economy to, I mean, and we can see this when you look around other, you know, people don't know that, for example, South Korea never shut down. South Korea never had a full lockdown. It never shut down its schools, except for very brief moments. Um, the same is true in Taiwan. You know, there's, there, there's, there was a more variegated experience, but the Chinese approached it in this kind of brutal China, you know, way that the Communist Party does, I'm not sure that, that I, I don't regard that as a great, great success. I also think that it came at a huge uh, cost. Yes, COVID cases are down to almost nothing, but they're down to almost nothing in a lot of places that didn't do what the Chinese did. We're going to take a short break here to talk about Asia Society's upcoming Global Talent, Diversity and Inclusion virtual symposium taking place on June 24 and 25. Over the course of two days, participants will learn about effective leadership during crisis, corporate responsibility in recognizing and fighting against racism, work resources that support mental health, and adapting to the future of the workplace environment. Register for free now at asiasociety.org slash diversity symposium. That's asiasociety.org slash diversity symposium. Now let's get back to the conversation. 
Um, so coming from out of all that, I mean, I think it's clear we have mixed report cards across the democracies and the authoritarian states. And uh, as I've written elsewhere, no clear, as it were, ideolo ideological winner out of this. <laughs> it's uh, actually a, um, a relatively um, murky set of outcomes. But those of us who come from democracies, the prima facie assumption being perpetrated by a number of commentators that this is authoritarianism one, democracy zero, uh, in the great, you know, football game of, uh, of the century, uh, just doesn't hold up against the data. Yeah. It's, a, it's a much uncleaner set of outcomes. Let me just drill down into one aspect of that, and it comes out of questions which are being thrown to us from those who are watching the, uh, the webinar, and that is um, on the application of the technologies of the surveillance state. Um, now, in China... Uh, where you've got um, uh, a range of technologies at the most elementary level, uh, people's uh, electronic ID cards, uh, the uh, facial recognition at airports, um, as well as tracking you through your payment system of Alipay and WePay, given that China has become a virtually cashless society these days. And so I've, ch I've spoken to Chinese colleagues about this. Uh, they say that, for example when Wuhan erupted, given the volume of, um, of holiday traffic, which would normally go to Shanghai out of Wuhan, um, that they braced themselves for what would happen in China's largest city and certainly most traveled city. Um, but by applying brutally these technologies, your term, brutally, but I agree with it, um, that um, the actual um, infection numbers in Shanghai were relatively modest, and certainly the deaths in Shanghai were relatively modest. So they would offer this as uh, a case study that um, you can turbocharge the interconnection between testing, uh, contact tracing, um, and then uh, let's call it lockdown and control uh, only through effective universal surveillance systems. As opposed to our South Korean friends who... Um, and our Taiwanese friends, and I think in Hong Kong as well, interesting case study, where, uh, frankly, uh, these intrusive surveillance technologies were not used. You had old-fashioned approaches whereby a lot of it was based on highly individualised telephone contact right. where people's personal data was not accessed. So on where tech surveillance technology goes out of this, looking at the thrust of the questions coming in, um, you've looked at this in terms of the state of the American democracy more broadly, but Western democracies, where do you think the trend line now takes us? More openness to surveillance, less openness to surveillance. Should we be more open? Should we be less open? Um, so I think you, you, you firstly, I, I agree with the way you characterized it in terms of the Chinese. It did help them. It's not clear how much you needed to do. In other words, it's not clear how... So when I've talked to health experts, they feel the single thing that the Chinese did that others did not do that helped them the most was not actually the, uh, the using of, of cell phone data involuntarily from people. It was the quarantining of individuals. You know, in every other country, essentially you quarantine with your family uh, if you're suspected. In China, they, they broke the families apart. They, you were quarantined into a makeshift hot, uh, hotel or hostel you were, you know, food was left at your door for 14 days. And so they broke the chain of transmission even within families. And that's, you know, it's, that's impressive. And that's, it is one of the flaws of our system where we, we do allow families to kind of huddle together, as I'm sure mine and yours are doing. Um, it's not, it wasn't so much the cell phones as, as it was that. And that is fair to say that would be hard to do in a democracy. But again, I say, you know, a lot of this, you get, 85 to 90 percent of the bang without having to do the authoritarian measures is my point. Mm. It's not that they don't work, but it's, it's not clear that you need them. On the, on the issue of the cell phones and, and the future of digital surveillance, look, I think for, this is a case where the pandemic is simply accelerating a trend that was, under, that was happening anyway. You know, there's a, a Lenin once said, uh, there are decades where uh, nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen. And the, I don't know if it's weeks, but there are months here where we, we've just like fast forwarded this whole digital economy. And so absolutely, you are going to have more, more uh, surveillance. 
you are going to have more surveillance that is linked to artificial intelligence, which will then be predictive in nature. And it's stunningly good, by, by mean effective. Because you, you know, what artificial intelligence is able to do is to find patterns, small patterns that you couldn't possibly understand because they're looking at hundreds of millions, billions of transactions. And so that becomes very, very valuable if you're thinking about a public health. We're at the infancy of it right now, so we don't quite see it, but you can imagine where it's going. I am comfortable with it as long as I live in a democracy. I have never been that worried about you know, the fact that Amazon and Google have my data. It's, I mean, first of all, it's anonymous data. Uh, you know, they're, they're not really that interested in me. Uh, it's not yet that good for those of us who, you know, I'm sure you, you, you notice this, Kevin, you buy a pair of shoes and for the next two months, every ad you get is for, for shoes. And you want, to tell the, you want to tell that AI machine, dude, I bought the pair of shoes. I don't need <laughs> shoes anymore, you know, or whatever it is. I mean, they're, they're, it's still in its infancy, but it's going to get better and better. The key is because it is these vast aggregated data sets, what the danger is, is that if somebody says, I want to look at you, Kevin Rudd, I can then search through that, those mountains of data and find out everything about you, every website you've done, every person you've been to. So there has to be a legal check on that. That is the danger. It's not you know, the other stuff is they're just trying to figure out what ads to give you. And they're trying to figure out when you get to a restaurant, you know, will they start, you know, uh, uh, suggesting wines for you and things like that. The danger is if somebody wants to search you and then look at all the things you've done digitally, look at your digital life. And I think that we do need very real protections on that. I think most democracies are aware of this. There are, they, they exist. They need to be I think we, this is an evolving process. And this is where I think it, there, there will be a big demarcation and a big difference between uh, living life in an authoritarian regime and living life in a democracy in the 21st century. Because we do have this Orwellian prospect that the government, should it choose, can know everything about you on a scale that has never been possible before in human history. It raises the important question, the extent to which, given our huge debate about artificial intelligence for the last several years, the extent to which AI and algorithms and algorithmic um, trajectories and predictions were effectively deployed in this crisis or not? Um, and uh, or was it a much, uh, shall we say, cruder application uh, and haphazard application of technologies uh, than uh, we anticipated or perhaps needed? And so I think that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Given so far, there is no, there's no evidence that AI played a very large role. I mean, it, it will in drug development because you do hmm. millions of iterations and things like that. But in the, in the parts we've been talking about, in the testing, contact tracing, uh, you know, quarantining, there hasn't been a particularly large role. But again, I'm a big believer in the power of artificial intelligence. I think it's just hmm. that we're at the infancy. No, I think that's true, and it's the eternal balancing act between what technology can do and the extent to which our laws uh, and regulations and the trust in, put in public officials is capable of managing it in a manner which maximises individual privacy and then maximises the public benefit when necessary. Exactly. And, there, and the devil lies in the detail of when necessary. Because if you go back to your nice phrase from Lenin before, um, not exactly a liberal democrat, um, the, uh, uh, and the Leninist state, and I'm a student of the Leninist state because I study Chinese politics as a matter of uh, professional discipline, is that um, our Leninist colleagues uh, for a long period of time uh, have been intimately familiar with the political science literature, which you and I know well, which is income levels rise to a certain point. Um, you get to middle income status. Uh, guess what? Um, uh, the middle class actually want more than simply consuming their pork quota each week. Um, and they aspire to a bigger, broader life, but also a bigger, broader say in the deliberations of governance and government in their countries. And so the dynamics uh, towards what's often called peaceful transition or non-peaceful transition occurs as you head down the, uh, the, uh, the conveyor belt uh, 
towards uh, one level of um, liberal or guided democracy uh, after another. So you know the literature uh, and uh, those tuning into our webinar will be familiar with it. And so every authoritarian system has been um, commissioning studies on how does this apply to us over time, um, including the Chinese system, which if you look at it, when they did Deng's reforms on reform and opening, here comes this huge additional uh, lump of income into people's pockets. That's great. We lift them out of poverty. Now they've become middle class. Now they've become seriously rich. And by the way, many of them have joined the Communist Party. Shoot, what are we going to do about that? So this is not a, an abstract seminar about power. It's a real seminar about power. And we're talking about democracy in authoritarian states. So courtesy of COVID, but courtesy of um, broader developments, which you've just been speaking about, to what extent do the same Leninists say, Eureka, um, the tech has finally arrived for us to permanently control uh, the uh, spontaneous combustion of democratic sentiment in increasingly capitalist societies. Um, and uh, a further eureka point, if we can now uh, legitimize our control mechanisms off the back of rolling public health crises and earlier terrorism challenges, uh, then we therefore uh, have permanent mechanisms through which to sustain absolute or near absolute political control. I'm sure you've thought about this, but given the dynamics of democracy in authoritarian states, your thoughts about where tech uh, takes the authoritarian democratic divide, because I've got a bunch of questions going to that. Um, yeah, look, I think it's not just tech. I think that if you think about the last 20 years, what we have had is we had, a, after the, uh, the, the Cold War, we've built a kind of uh, international order that is very open, very dynamic, and very unstable. So if you think of the number of financial crises alone that have taken place in the last 30 years, and it's not just 08. If you think about it, there was the Mexican crisis, the East Asian crisis, the Russian default, long-term capital imploding, the tech bubble bursting, right? I mean, there's, a, there's been a series of, of these crises. You think about terrorism, it's not just 9-11, as you know, it's the stuff that happened before and the, the stuff after. Each of these has allowed the state to become more powerful. Uh, mm. The pandemic is the, the third of these big shocks. If you think of, you know, the, the geopolitical shock of terrorism, the geoeconomic shock of these financial crises, and now the biological shock uh, of, of pandemics, all of them has, uh, have allowed the state to accumulate greater powers. For the most part, in, in democracies, that hasn't been too bad. But I am I'm very distressed by the expansion of, of police power in the United States, for example, in terms of surveillance, in terms of uh, you know, the things that Homeland Security can, can do. I think other in places like uh, Turkey, Erdogan has used that very effectively to consolidate greater and greater power. You know, we, people point out in the last 15 years, there's been a kind of decline in the number and the quality of democracies around the world. I think it's related to this trend because the governments have been given opportunities to do this. So technology becomes the, you know, the final straw here. And I, I think that the, the crucial issue is going to be, uh, do you have strong laws that protect individuals, that, in, that protect their privacy, protect their, um, their, their rights? Um, there is an argument that dictatorships become hyper-efficient and hyper-effective using artificial intelligence. Um, I see the argument, and I think that there's certainly that danger. But I tend to think that at the end of the day, it doesn't change the point you were making, Kevin, which is the Maslowian hierarchy. At some point, people don't want to be governed as pawns on a chess table. Um, and that might mean many different things. It doesn't always mean Western liberal democracy. But I don't believe the argument that Confucianism somehow means that the Chinese uh, are entirely content to just live their lives, allowing the Communist Party to do whatever it wants. And my strongest evidence for this is two very vibrant Chinese societies, that is Taiwan and Hong Kong, where mm. clearly that is not true. And what is the difference between Taiwan and Hong Kong? They're richer than China. That's the, as far as I can tell, there's no cultural differences between them that are of any significance. The big difference is they're higher up on that Maslowian hierarchy and they are 
both very reluctant to give up their autonomy, their individualism, their freedom. And yeah, they are more collectivist. They're, you know, there is that Asian Western di di difference uh, along many dimensions, but they're still very rec recognizably uh, societies that value freedom and individual rights. So I, I wouldn't give up on democracy as yet. And I don't think that artificial intelligence means uh, that, you know, that you will have to, to live through that. You have to fight for it. Um, that's for sure. You know, you talked about the transition to, to uh, democracy. I think it's worth remembering. Uh, it wasn't a peaceful transition in Taiwan. It wasn't a peaceful transition in South Korea. It wasn't a peaceful transition in the West. I mean, the absolutist monarchs of the 19th century certainly did not want democracy. Uh, you know, they, there's, a, there's a real struggle here. And there is human agency, and, mm. and it, 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 it matters. But in every one of those cases, what you found is over time, people didn't, didn't want to live, uh, uh, you know, feel subjugated, feel, feel that they, were, they, had, they had no political agency. Look, everyone wants to be, every dictatorship wants to be Singapore. Because Singapore is very unusual. It, ha it has given people a lot of autonomy and, and a sense of individual freedom. Uh, as, as you know, most people don't. The Singapore, Singapore is actually a much more open place than people realize. For example, the internet is completely unmonitored and unregulated in, in Singapore. Um, I, I think it's a very difficult balance to achieve. It's, a fi it's five million people, hyper-efficient, hyper-competent government. It does have some elements of participation through a kind of one-party guided democracy and such. I, I think it would be very difficult for people to, you know, that, that is a balance that is very hard to get to. And it, the Chinese have been looked, as you well know, have looked at it ever since Deng. They've sent teams of people to Singapore to figure out how does this country manage to have kind of a democracy where the ruling party always gets 80% of the seats. They, you know, if they could manage that, they'll probably do that as well. I, I think, you know, just as the great challenge in the Western world, I would argue sort of getting to Denmark. You know, how do you get to be <laughs> uh, a... A, a society like Denmark, where people are happy, the state, you know, it's a free market society, a good safety net that is both broad, but also very efficient. The, the challenge for every authoritarian regime is how do you get to, Sing to Singapore? And the, answer, the short answer is very hard. It's interesting what you say. I've been rereading some of the um, uh, Communist Party documents from the 80s and 90s. Uh, and the big debate in China at the time was this, how do you go... How do you engineer a political future for China, which is uh, uh, Singaporean on the one hand uh, and with a Nordic welfare system on the other? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it was like actually actively discussed. I mean, how could you yeah. land at that um, at the end of the day? Uh, of course, you had the gestalt impact of Tiananmen, uh, which was um, uh, we're about to lose power. Uh, and then, of course, you had the implosion of the Soviet Union, and uh, all of that then was uh, interpreted as a series of learnings within the Chinese communist system. And but so, I think that's uh, a very important uh, that's a very important point you made, Kevin. That very few people remember, which is that China was actively debating in the late 1980s all kinds of reform, economic, political. So when we think that there is there is only one future for China, and that Xi Jinping. I mean, you know, who knows? Life is long. The guy's been in power for five years or, or, or you know, five, five or six years. We'll see that, you know, that, that, that what, your, what your description of the 80s, which I think so much people so often forget, tells you there's, you know, there's a lot going on in, in that black box that is the Communist Party of China. Yeah, the internal debates are uh, fascinating, including bringing us back to the subject about the response to uh, COVID-19, uh, the effectiveness of the party in responding to that. I mean, often those of us in the West look at the Chinese propaganda apparatus, the wolf warriors, etc., and say, um, well, uh, it's clear that the line is everything is um, fine and dandy and uh, neat and under control. Uh, those of us who study the system for a while uh, understand that it's less like that. Also, your important historical reflection, uh, Farid, about Taiwan. I, um, uh, when I was a kid there, uh, it was still martial law. And I, I remember I, I used to live uh, uh, for, because I had no money, at this uh, centre uh, not far from Taiwan University, 
call the uh, KMT, Anti-Communist Recover the Mainland International Youth Activity Centre. Uh, <laughs> and, and let me tell you, <laughs> and, and Friday night we had to watch KMT propaganda movies. <laughs> it was part of the deal. I don't think it had a huge effect on me. <laughs> But it's kind of interesting. Then he went through uh, the emergence of the what's called the DPP, Democratic Progress Party, and then the the uh, horrendous idea that in fact these guys might get elected, and they did. And Tsai Ing Wen's their second um, sort of significant term. It's a very untidy process. Uh, Farid, um, the uh, only last uh, question I've got, and we've got two minutes to go, so I'll give you a sixty-second quick hit on this, which is. Um, um, the uh, World Health Organization's copped uh, a lot of criticism, um, some of it justified perhaps and a lot of it not. Your reflections on how they have performed so far, and then I'll draw this to close in a couple of minutes' time. I think the WHO um, is, was excessively deferential to China. I think that that's, it's fair to say that, and I think it probably was excessively deferential to China, partly because Dr. Tedros was a candidate that the Chinese had backed. Um, I don't think they backed him, by the way, for particularly nefarious mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, he was a very competent minister of health in Ethiopia. Um, but the, the, the bigger issue is why were they so deferential uh, outside of that personal issue? It's because the WHO, like all UN uh, agencies, as, as you well know, are defined by their subservience to the member states. They are not supranational world government bodies. They are required to be deferential to mem member states. They have no enforcement authority. They have no disciplining authority. They have no punishment authority. And so they rely f for the me member states on cooperation. And they probably are particularly reliant on the large donors. This is most true, by the way, of the United States. The WHO is incredibly deferential to the United States. That is the nature and, you know, it may be a flaw, but it is the original flaw of the system of international cooperation we have. Now, I would argue, just a final closing thought, what this pandemic shows us is that we have real problems in the world, and they are all global. They are, they are by nature global. And pandemic is, I mean, by definition, it's a global, it, it doesn't worry about borders, it doesn't worry about your race, ethnicity, caste, creed. Clearly, we need global solutions. And the answer is not that the WHO should be defunded, is it should be structured in a way that it would have the authority the next time around to be able to have the capacity to push back in some way, not just against China, but against every government, including the United States, which is, of course, why it doesn't have it, because the United States has never wanted a, 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 a UN agency to have that kind of authority. That's all for this week's episode of Asia In Depth. Our next episode will drop on June 25 as we switch to posting every other week for the summer. As always, subscribe and check out our previous episodes on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our show page at asiasociety.org podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm Michelle Fleurcruz. See you next time.